control theory is something that we talked about in system dynamics, ME370, the newly christened system dynamics and control, I think, or something like that. I don't know, I renamed it. I should probably know what it's called. Something like that. And you get a little bit of an introduction to it there, and we, I mean, we did, we talked about root locus, and we did some basic design that was pretty much based on changing the gain in a loop, in a feedback loop, and that was about all we could do, we did a little bit of design with that. So today, we're going to review that, like all of the all of the topics that we discussed previously just to make sure we're all on the same footing um, and then we're going to proceed with some new material as well today since we do a week's worth of class in one day ooh silver bullet nice choice <laughs> so yeah <laughs> So, let's do that. It's, so there's a little bit, I mean, there's like 13 lectures. I'm not going to go through all of the stuff in this 13 lectures on controls. But I, I want to really sort of dwell on the beginning part so we remember, like, what is controls? What are we doing again? What is the whole point of it? And so usually we remember the silly, like, procedural things, how to compute this or that maybe, but we don't remember like the big picture sometimes, which is what we really want to be able to take into the rest of this course, because in robotics and automation, you really need to understand control theory. You need to understand how to make something do what you want it to do, okay? Because you can't build a robot, you can't automate anything unless you can you can control some basic variable. Like uh, this morning when I was doing a demo for the students and we were controlling the angle of a linkage that was connected to a motor. Um, you gotta be able to do that before you can build a robot. So that's where we're gonna begin is, is control. How do we b control something that's simple with simple theory and technique? So that's where we begin. Uh, so, we'll often call the system that we're trying to control the plant, okay? And we recall that there's an output to this plant, and this output to the plant is some variable probably that we care about, like what is the angular position of the arm or something, or of, the, of the link. And we have an input, like... The, for instance, in that system that I was using this morning, there was a motor, and so there was a voltage input to the motor, so that you could consider the controller to be, de to be determining what the voltage is that's applied to the motor that creates a linkage uh, motion that has some angle that is what we're trying to control. Okay, And the inputs to the plant are what the controller can affect, right? So the system is there and the only way you can change what's happening in the system is by controlling the inputs, right? So like the voltage to the motor, you can control that. Um, and then the, the, the system also has different outputs, but specifically in the case of the motor, we might care just about the link angular position. That might be all we care about. We might care about more, but that is uh, the simplest case. So, if we understood the system well enough, if we understood that motor and the linkage and all that system well enough, uh, we could just specify an input and we would just be able to predict what the output would be, right? We understood that if we had a model that was good enough, we could just say, okay, if you put in four volts, then this is the response that's going to happen. And you could predict and therefore control perfectly what your output is based on just changing your input. However, in the real world, we don't have 
perfect knowledge of the systems. And most of the times our models are approximations. And sometimes they're very gross approximations. They're not even very good. But uh, nonetheless, they're almost always going to be imperfect. Okay, And so over time, at least, there will be an accumulation of error from your mo between your model and what's actually happening. And you can't rely on putting in like four volts to the motor and expecting a certain behavior to happen from the motor. You may have lost, uh, your position might be way off by that point. So, if we were to do that, it would be called open loop control. Just like putting in an input and then just expecting, you know, the output to be a certain thing based on our model of it. Um, but that's very rarely used um, because it's so unreliable. Because we can't predict very well what the system is going to do over time. So what we do instead is we use feedback, okay? And closed loop control uses feedback. So we measure the outputs and we feed them back to a controller. The controller has uh, at its disposal what you want that, that output to be, right? You want that output to be a certain thing, like the motor with the link, you want the angle to be a certain angle, right? And it compares it, and then it decides to operate however it, you've designed the controller to operate on the plant or on the system with the system's inputs, okay? So in the case of the motor and the link, it'll determine what the motor to the voltage, or the, the voltage to the motor will be based on uh, what the error currently is, or maybe even a history of the error in certain cases. So, um, there are lots of different types, and there are different design trade-offs. Uh, some controllers are more expensive to implement, and, and some uh, are less expensive. You can get away with, I mean, the float valve in a toilet is actually a control system. I mean, not the valve itself, but the, the whole system together is a control system. It, it shuts off the water when it gets to a certain height. It turns it on when it goes below that. And so you can regulate what the height of the water is. It's not a very, uh, it's not a very um, flexible control system. It only can do just that. And you can just kind of adjust mechanically what height that is. But that's, that's about it. It's all your only options. But it has the advantage of being very robust. So if you were to use a microcontroller to do your toilet, you're, you're using the wrong method. Um, it's just not, I mean, you could have a microcontroller in there that's like measuring the water level and releasing seen, the tank. Have you ever seen a Japanese toilet? I've not. Oh, yeah, like yeah. seat warmers and <laughs> the, the with temperature adjustments and pressure adjustments. Oh, I like there are that. these giant control panels next to them. Nice. <laughs> there's there's actually, absolutely, yeah. absolutely anything. <laughs> there's a lot out there for like toilet seats and advanced controls. For John's fluid class, I did an assignment of designing an alternative flushing mechanism and seat. And yeah, wow. some of those Japanese and Chinese companies that have made some toilets are insane. There's so much control in them, it's disgusting. You'll easily see 20 or 30 buttons next to it. <laughs> well, touche. Touche. Uh, yeah. Uh, in a typical American dumb toilet, you probably don't need a microcontroller. Well, I mean, you really, if you're, all you're trying to do is regulate water level, uh, microcontroller is not the way to go. If you want to, if you want to regulate more things like temperature of the seat and whatnot, then maybe the microcontroller is the way to go. RGB right? Yeah. Enya in the background. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I. Oh, nice. I I have that too. Um, okay, so so we need to we need to be able to evaluate. So there are different types of controllers. You can do it go with like a completely analog controller. You can do a digital controller. Like we're going to focus on digital control in this class, even when we don't 
specifically speak in terms of digital control um, because in a lot of applications that you guys are going to need to use control systems and automation and the microcontroller is your friend and that's where you want to go um, there are other possibilities in other situations but you can learn those techniques in an easier way. So the control theory is good for those applications that are more advanced, I guess. And that's what we're going to learn about. Um, so one of the things that, you know, I guess we have to decide at this point is how do we decide which controller is better? So like, you know, we have two people design controllers in class. Serac designs a controller and Blake designs a controller. Um, we need to be able to evaluate which controller is performing better, right? Because you could put them both in there, but which one's performing better is a question we need to be able to answer. And you can't always rely on a really nice video to tell you which one's better. So that was a reference to the Serac video. That was really cool. <laughs> I'm the one who's tired. You guys aren't allowed to be tired right now. I'm the one who's tired. Okay. So, when we evaluate the performance of these control systems, we have sort of two different ways of going about evaluating. Or sort of two different domains we can think about. The first is it's transient response. Okay. So, if you change, well, so first off, the transient response of a system. To an initial condition, you like you could set, start off a, a a pendulum with an initial position, and then it's just going to respond by swinging back and forth for a long time and slowly damping. Right. So, the transient response is what happens for all of that time, and we care about how that that system responds. So, if we're controlling it in some way, pendulum is a bad example of this because we don't inverted pendulum would be an example of this. So. Good segue into the inverted pendulum. Oh, didn't even plan that. So, would you mind demonstrating this amazing device? We have a real live inverted pendulum segue here that connects up to his space age computerized handheld device. Whoa! I'm very impressed. <laughs> How long does it last? I get about 15 miles on it. Wow. And it, it's, it's like. I'm sure it's lithium ion. It's what they use in everything now. Not even that expensive either. Like the, like the big segways are like, you see, like $25,000 to $50,000. For the big fancy ones. For the big fancy ones, and this thing was around the grand. I mean, well, regular normal, price. Normal right? prices. I got it for like six hundred. Yeah. So not bad, all things considered. Yeah. Is it worth it? Um, I think it depends where you live, really, yeah. how much use yeah. you can actually get out of it. Do so yeah. you well up hills and whatnot? You can do uh, inclines, but really steep hills, it struggles, and that yeah. also depends on your. I think I think it's like tw yeah, twelve twelve hundred watts, yeah. like six hundred yeah. watts each wheel. Wow! Just like plug it into the wall and charge it. Yep. Charges like four hours. It's pretty so, cool. I mean, you have good maneuverability. So is it balancing with that. you or are you balancing? It's balancing me. So if I if I lean forwards, it accelerates forwards to try to stay under me. And same with back. I was doing jumps. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little heavy for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it weighs like 20 pounds. So, you can imagine that it matters how the controller goes to an upright position. So, so obviously this thing's controlling multiple things, but one of the main things that's controlling is that this pendulum stays vertical, right? And if it was not controlling that, it would fall over. So, how it gets to vertical is pretty important because 
Otherwise, poor John would be thrown around the room. Like, for instance, if it decided it was going to get to the vertical by swinging back and forth a few times, um, it wouldn't be very good. So, we could, we could demonstrate that. <laughs> so it obviously can't it, it, tell it when you're on it. Some extent, like, it. It gets up right for the most part, but it doesn't actually tilt that much. Okay. And I can actually uh, remote, remote control it. Oh my goodness. What is happening <laughs> Whoa. I, think, I think we're going to snap that That is so cool. It's like a dog. <laughs> so the takeaway here is buy one of those. <laughs> so I think we should put a little bow tie on You should have gotten one of those. Because it's really good. That's awesome. So at the end of the class, we will definitely be able to build things like that. Easy. Weekend, maybe two. Okay? We're going to make this catch on following views. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it stands below it. <laughs> it like goes to the side to do a soft catch. <laughs> There's actually some uh, AI robot attachment for this. So, like, this, this uh, V bar actually comes off and you slide a robot and, like, AI attachment on top of it that can drive around on its own. Wow. Take pictures and stuff. Jeez. Don't tell it where you hide your gun. <laughs> okay. So, that is really cool. Thank you for bringing that and showing us. So, the, the control aspect of that, which is, I mean, most of it is a control system that's keeping that upright. And if, if, we, if we care about different aspects. Like for instance, we care about how long it takes to get vertical. We care about if it overshoots it and swings back and forth a few times. Like we care about all of those things. And so the transient response is very important to us. Um, so that's one thing we need to keep in mind when we're designing controllers and, and evaluating the, the performance. Similarly with steady state response, so if it doesn't quite get to vertical, if it gets to like a small angle from vertical, that might not be ideal for some applications. Maybe one degree is fine, maybe 10 degrees is way too much. It depends on the application, how much steady state error you can tolerate. So that's another thing to be concerned about. And then finally, stability, uh, which in a lot of ways is our first concern. Um, the system stability is different in open loop and closed loop. So you can have an open loop system that's unstable. And this is actually an excellent example of that. Because I don't know about you guys, but um, I have tried to balance things before and it, they don't just stay like that unless I'm very, very good at keeping them balanced. An inverted pendulum is very hard to keep balanced unless it's uh, depending on how it is and depending on how awesome you are. Um, like, like a broom isn't so bad. You can kind of keep those. Have you guys tried that? Balancing a broom? Not so bad. Uh, that's an inverted pendulum, pendulum problem. And that is a system that's inherently unstable, right? Very much unstable. But you can stabilize it with a feedback controller. And you can actually make it into a stable system. Of course, if you lose power to your controller, then it's unstable again. So it's good to never to forget that you were dealing with an unstable system. But there are lots of unstable systems. It's very bright. It's like a mirror on the floor right there. Whew. Okay. Uh, yeah. So stability matters. Some others, of course, cost, weight, complexity, uh, robustness. So... One of the great things about the toilet float valve is they're very robust. Hard to screw up that. I mean, those things can last for decades. Never screw up one time. Uh, so, yeah, robustness matters a lot. 
um, if you have conditions that are changing or that are harsh, then what your controller design is is uh, uh, going to be affected by that. So you can have a very elegant controller, uh, but if it doesn't fit the application, then that's that's not uh, a good controller for that application. By definition, in fact. But the idea is that there are certain situations where uh, a more blunt instrument is better and, and more robust than uh, and, and should be used instead of a more elegant uh, electronics based controller for instance. So a useful tool for designing control systems is block diagram. We're all familiar with this but I just want to go back through this and remind ourselves. So we've got the plant, its output, its input Okay, so if we didn't have this feedback controller on it, this is all it would be, and we would just be set, sitting here trying to change the inputs so that the output was what we wanted. But hard to do unless we know what that output is. So now we're going to use feedback and do closed loop control. So feed it back. Command goes into the summing junction. The difference between the command and the output of the plant that's fed back is the error. We want them to be the same, right? So we say it should be at five degrees. If the actual thing is at two degrees, the error is three degrees, right? Difference. And we give that to their controller, and our controller needs to make a, an intelligent decision about how to how to output control effort into the plant's inputs. Okay. So if it's done well, then this output will get closer to the command. If it's done poorly, then it could get further away. I mean, your controller can do very bad things. You, you can take a, make a, a stable system unstable, and you can make a, a, an unstable system stable. So it's, it, goes, it works both ways. So you have to be cautious when you put in a controller, too. Um, we want the error to be zero, and we can also solve for, remember transfer functions, right? So C of S describes the transfer function of a controller. The plant can be described by a transfer function G of S. When I say that they can be described by these transfer functions, I mean that if they're linear, they can be described by a transfer function. If they're nonlinear, it doesn't have a transfer function. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of nonlinear stuff. However, one thing that I will mention about nonlinearities, the most common by far way of dealing with nonlinear systems is to, for the modeling, is to just linearize your model about some operating point. So say you're going to be operating, so say like the whole thing is very nonlinear, but you're going to be operating at like small angles from zero. So like, okay, it's like an inverted pendulum. It's very nonlinear, but it's kind of linear when you're talking about small angles around here. So you could do a model and a controller based on a, a linear controller or a linear plant. It's linearized about the certain angle that you're operating at. That's by far the most common. And if you have a state or a, a state model developed that's nonlinear, which is totally fine. Just say, I mean, one thing you could I mean, one nonlinearity that's really easy to throw in is friction might not be linear. Uh, it might not be viscous stamping. It could be dry friction or something. Not linear. And so you immediately have uh, a nonlinear system. You can't dri drive a transfer function. You can't do the linear A, B, C, D state model. You can't do any of that stuff. But you can... Um, you can still develop that that A B C D model in the state space, or the transfer function. All of that stuff is still still applies around an operating point, and computing that is actually pretty easy. I mean, it's you have to take the Jacobian matrix, which is a bunch of derivatives. Did you guys do the Jacobian in calculus class? Yeah, you have to compute a Jacobian and evaluate it at a certain value. I mean, it's not like something I would want to do by hand a lot, but it's something that you can do in MATLAB really easily. 
So you can linearize a system really easily. So even if it's nonlinear, linearizing it is not hard. Just a little sidebar. Um, okay, so the closed loop transfer function, so these transfer functions go from, say, like the control effort through the plant to the output. So it takes this control effort, it turns it into an output. That's what the, the G of S, the plant transfer function does. The controller takes the error and gives you a control effort, right? That's what that transfer function does. Now, what we care about oftentimes, we care about several transfer functions here, but the one that's sort of the overarching important transfer function in this is we care about the, the closed loop, so-called closed loop transfer function. That is the transfer function from R all the way to Y. So we want to know how the closed loop system is going to respond to changes in the input R. So say we decided to change very suddenly our command from taking the angle thing um, from 0 degrees and now we want it to be at 45 degrees. If we did that very suddenly, um, then we're immediately going to have an error. We're going to see some response of this whole system, right? Hopefully it's going to approach 45 degrees eventually, but we care about what's going to happen to the output y when we change our command. And that's generally the thing that's most interesting to us, is what's the performance when I change my command? Um, if I change my command very slowly, if I, maybe if I ramp it up, or if I increase it exponentially, or if I did a sinusoidal, what would it look like? What would the response look like? So we care about that transfer function. It's the closed loop transfer function. It sort of governs a lot of stuff for us. And that is a little derivation down here that we went through. It's just this. It's GC, so the plant times the controller, divided by 1 plus GC. So those transfer functions from the controller and from the plant combine in this way. So then we can determine if the design meets our needs by seeing if the response for this transfer function is what we want. Okay, So this is how we combine things. So I took a little bit of time on that because I wanted to make sure that we remembered all of that. Um, let's talk a little bit about stability. Okay, Woo, Stability. So, in a lot of ways, it's the most important because if it's not stable, it's not a good system. And if it's not at least closed loop stable, it's not a good system. Um, so no matter how great your settling time is or whatever, it isn't even really valid to think of it if it's unstable. Um, if it's unstable, it's not good. So we went through a little bit more of a lengthy discussion of stability in the controls part uh, in, as opposed to the systems part of the class because when you bring in the controls aspect you bring in this idea of, of not just is it is it stable with regard to initial conditions will it settle down to some equilibrium um, but it, it, there's also the idea of input stability so bounded input bounded output stability so <laughs> you can define stability in terms of if I put in an input that's bounded in time, will my output be bounded in time? It's another way to frame it. And so we talked about that too. Um, so we said it's uh, a linear time invariant system is stable if the natural response approaches zero as time approaches infinity. That's the initial condition response. Um, an LTI system, linear time invariant system, is unstable if the natural response grows without bound as time approaches infinity. And it's marginally stable if it neither decays nor grows, or remains constant or oscillates as time approaches infinity. There's also the bounded input, bounded output definition. So a system is stable if every bounded input yields a bounded output. It's unstable if any bounded input yields an unbounded output. So those are two different, are two different variations of stability. We more commonly think in terms of this natural or initial condition response. Um, but this is also a, a way to think about stability. Um, 
and so the green is the important stuff, I guess. So stable systems have closed loop transfer functions with poles only in the left half plane. So remember that? So it's closed loop stable if the closed loop poles are in the left half plane, meaning that the real parts of those poles are, have negative values, right? They're negative real parts. So if we look at the complex plane, remember we would think about the pole zero plot, where we would plot what, where the poles of the transfer function are and where the zeros of the transfer function are. If all the poles are in the left half plane, meaning that their real parts are negative, that means that we're going to have stability. Now, that is... Um, a consequence of how you solve for the response. The poles end up playing a major uh, role in the response. And you, can, you may remember that in the natural response, there's always these exponentials that either decay, are constant, or they, they explode. So that, that's, what's, that's why, I mean, it's not just magic why the, when the poles are in the left half plane, it's for that reason that it's stable. Similarly, unstable systems have closed loop transfer function uh, uh, functions with at least one pole in the right half plane and or poles of multiplicity greater than one on the imaginary axis. This is a kind of a, an edge case subtlety thing that I didn't necessarily expand on a lot and it's sort of a weird edge case, but what if you had um, this situation where you have a double pole on the imaginary axis. So when we have poles on the imaginary axis, we know that assuming that there are no poles in the right half plane, we know that we have a marginally stable system, typically. However, if there's a multiplicity greater than one, which I mean is almost a contrived case, but maybe this is what you have. Um, then when you solve the differential equation, remember the homogeneous solution is going to have, when you have a multiplicity, you have to put a t in to your solution for one of those terms. And that means that your, your amplitude of oscillation is actually going to increase linearly with time. Edge case, like I said, doesn't, I mean, it's very rare, but it's good to keep that in mind. So... Uh, there is a possibility of having instability in that case. It looks like marginal stability, but it's actually uh, unstable. So, good to keep that in mind. Usually, nobody even mentions it. But lambda has two, it's the same, right? Yeah, so that's when lambda one, and so say you had a second order system, you had two <coughs> poles, um, they're equal to each other. And they're imaginary. Um, <coughs> so in that case, they would have to be a zero, a double pull at zero. Um, if you had uh, like a fourth order system, you could have two poles show up, uh, two pairs showing up like on top of each other, which is weird, but it's possible. Um, okay. Identifying stable systems from closed loop transfer functions. So it would be nice if we could look at the closed loop transfer function and just determine if it's stable or not, right? So let's do that. The uh, let the denominator of a closed loop transfer function be the polynomial this, right? It's always going to be some polynomial in S, where S is, we often think about S as being the Laplace transform variable, although we've learned how to define transfer functions Without Laplace transforms and system dynamics, we also learn to do them with Laplace transforms, which is my preference. So we can factor this polynomial and write it as a bunch of factored terms, right? So if the system is stable, it must have all left half plane poles. So all of the AIs must have negative real parts, right? All bi's must be positive, 
And additionally, all bi's must be non-zero. This second two may not be obvious. The first one I think is pretty obvious. If you have a, uh, a positive real part in uh, A1, then you're going to end up with a pole. Uh, so these are the poles, essentially, right? So if you plugged in A1 in here, this is gonna this is gonna cancel out this whole term, right? It'd be zero. A1 minus A1. And if this is the denominator of your transfer function, which it is, that makes it a pole, right? Because that's the definition of a pole, is whenever the denominator of your transfer function goes to zero. So all the A1s, A2s, etc. are poles, so that means that they must have negative real parts. If you factor it out, you should be able to see that. Okay, they all have to have negative real parts. In addition, it may not be so obvious that all of the B coefficients here must be positive. Okay, so that's one condition. And all of them must be non-zero. So you can't have any missing powers of S. So if you have like a third order system, if you have positive number times s cubed plus positive number times s squared plus positive number times s plus positive number, we know that we have a stable system. Okay, well, actually, no, we don't. We don't know that. It's a, only a necessary condition. We might have a stable system. If, however, we had positive coefficient times s cubed plus 0 times s squared, s squared one was gone, plus positive times s plus positive whatever, that is an unstable system. If you had the sign change at all, so if it was positive, negative, positive coefficients, you know it's unstable. However, if they are all um, positive and non-zero, then you might be stable. So these are necessary, these BI conditions are merely necessary conditions for stability, meaning that they are necessary for stability but not sufficient. Okay, something more is needed to ensure stability. So you may have been in a math class and they tried to talk about necessary and sufficient. I probably talked about it. Um, but necessary means that it has to be the case uh, in order for the result to be true, uh, but it doesn't necessarily imply that the, the result is true. So efficient would say that it, it implies that it's true as well. However, if they are not met, this is a sufficient condition to draw the conclusion that the control system is unstable. So, one way to look at it is to say, oh, okay, this polynomial, we could factor it and we'll know for sure because we'll have all of the poles, right? <clears throat> but you don't even have to factor, you can just look at the polynomial and say, you can, first off, you can say, definitely unstable if it has a negative in there, or if it's missing a power, definitely unstable. Or you could say, could be stable, we don't know yet. We'll have to explore more. Okay, so that was that. And then we did Routh arrays, so Routh tables. So do you guys remember this? Where we would find the closed loop transfer function polynomial, right? And then we would plug it into this Routh table and say, OK, we, we would compute and we would say, okay, we'll compute this whole table. Like, we, we can go down mechanically, just you know, one thing falls from the next thing, falls from the next thing. It's just an algorithm. And then we look to this first column and say, oh, if a sign changes in this first column, then we have instability. And sure enough, in this case, this term, it goes from it goes positive, 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 negative, positive. So it has two sign changes and it is unstable. Um, and it has two poles in the right-half plane. The number of right-half right plane poles is equal to the number of sign changes. 
And this is useful. And remember, we could just, in this numerical case here, we can just compute what the poles are, right? We could just go through, and so you could either factor this, or you could numerically solve for what the roots are of that polynomial. Not hard to do. But when we do controller design, we want to be able to solve for these cases with unknown parameters in here. So instead of being 10, 35, and 50, we might have like mass 2. And so what the Routh table gives us are conditions on our parameters for stability, which is cool. So that's some that's a sort of design tool you can use. And this is a lot of what control theory is, is just like design tools, trying to come up with different methods of getting what you want out of a system. And so that's one of them, the Routh, the Routh array, Routh table. Okay. Uh, good. And then we talked about steady state errors. Whee! <clears throat> Come from a lot of things. Nonlinearities, disturbances, um, and the input command type and the plant dynamics. Uh, we're going to focus on three, but two is similar. Feedback control, fortunately, can deal with all of these cases. Okay, we're going to focus on a couple of them. So, steady state errors for Unity Feedback System. Um, so it's uncommon, so this is an important thing to note too, it's uncommon for a feedback system to be truly Unity. However, as shown in this section of the NIST textbook, non-Unity feedback systems can be rewritten and evaluated in terms of Unity feedback counterparts. For this reason, we focus on Unity feedback systems. So we're going to talk about it in those terms because you can always turn it into that problem if you want to. Um, so we talked about the final value theorem. And this is all just going through an argument that says, if you have this type of command, then you have to have this many integrators in your controller in order to get zero steady state error or determine what the steady state error would be. Because some applications, steady state error is tolerable. We just need it to be small. So we need to compute the steady state error or we need to know how many integrators we need to make that zero for get different commands. And that, we go through the whole argument here and it's quite interesting. Um, but you end up with this formula for, um, this is for the a, 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 uh, unit step command. A unit step command has zero, well, it has steady state error 1 over 1 plus kp, where kp is the limit as s approaches 0 of the plant transfer function. So you can compute that if you want to. Um, and that is valid for a step input. Uh, and you can do that for the other canonical inputs too, ramp and a, para and a parabola. Uh, and these are the steady state error formulas. Uh, the type is the, uh, the type is the number of integrators in it, in the, in the plant. So, so this is the table relationship between the input system type, static error constants, and steady state errors. So if you have a type 2 system, no. I'm going to go back here. Ah. By itself in the denominator, the, uh, power is S. Yeah, so this system type here is the, the number of integrators in the forward path, so G. So that, yeah, I was right. Um, the steady state error for other commands and system type can be derived in the same manner. 
So here is the air constant if you have uh, no integrators and so a step input and uh, no integrators in your plant you're gonna have a constant KP and so you plug your KP value into this steady state error formula and that gives you your steady state error. So it's kind of a table, yeah. Why does this analysis just use the forward uh, It's because, because it's just analyzing the system and not the we're doing unity feedback here and the argument goes we're going to choose unity feedback um, because we can always rewrite, like I said here, we can always rewrite a non-unity feedback system into a unity feedback system. So we'll do the analysis on unity feedback, and if you have a non-unity feedback system, then you can just transform it into unity feedback system and then do this analysis on it. So that's why we're using, it's easier to do the, it's easier to follow the argument. So if you go through this argument, it's a little bit easier to follow if it's a unity feedback than if it has non-unity feedback. Um, in reality, we always have non-unity feedback because we don't have access to the parameter directly, typically. Like we have access to a voltage and there's some sort of there's some sort of transfer function between that and what the actual command is. So like you care about the angle but you don't measure, like your, your uh, measurement doesn't come to you in like a number of degrees. It comes to you in a number of volts, and you have a transfer function from that to the number of degrees. The, so that's just a constant feedback uh, transfer function. But if you have a dynamic measurement, which is always the case, so assuming that your measurement system is not totally perfect and it takes has some dynamic response to it like so for instance your scale Have you guys ever set something on a scale before and seen that the numbers fluctuate for a little bit um, same with if you use a multimeter the values fluctuate it's not instantaneously the true value or the measurement so you have a response and that's what that feedback transfer function typically is representing so when you have that H in your feedback path. So if we wanted to determine the, the type of system we're dealing with, what would be the like the closed loop transfer function, we first have to turn that into a unity feedback and then use the, the forward transfer function to do this analysis? Or is there a way to do this with the closed loop transfer function? Well, so you almost always you almost always know the the forward path, or the open loop transfer function and the forward path transfer function. You almost always know those. Um, if you ever have the closed loop, you got it from the open loop. So, yeah, I can't imagine a situation where that wouldn't be true. You can only contract. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, yeah, so you would, but you would want to, you would want to use your open loop. The idea with this is that you can find out stuff about the closed loop transfer function, for instance, what its steady state error is going to be from its open loop transfer function, which is pretty cool. I mean, that's a whole motivation. We don't want to, we don't want to have to necessarily find the closed loop transfer function um, before we uh, find out this information. So, yeah. So we can we can design for steady state error and reduction of steady state error by essentially increasing the number of integrators. Okay. Uh, but it comes at a cost that we'll learn about later. Uh, but steady state wise, it doesn't come at any cost. It's great. I mean, steady state, you just keep adding in integrators. You might well might as well have fifty. Why not fifty integrators? That means that I could do some crazy. Uh, uh, command types and have no steady state error. It's true, but you pay for it in transient. That's where you mainly pay for it, is in your transient response. So, that's why you don't want to just add a whole bunch of 
integrators in. Okay. And then, you know, there are examples. So I gave this to you guys all filled in so you can review it all on your own. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Are they like, totally blank or just like partial? I mean, yeah, so these are like partial, it looks like. Uh, I can I can upload the full ones. Yeah. Well, that one's full. One. Yeah, some of them are full. I'll, I'll go through and make sure, but they should all at least have something. It shouldn't just be like blank files. Yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, okay, okay. Cool. Yeah, and I'll, I can go through it, but I also sent out the notes from on Slack. Yeah, and that, those should be the full ones. Right? Yeah. yeah. Really? Uh, huh. I'll go back through and look. Yeah, I got some in there. Huh. Okay, well I I'll go back and look and see. Yeah. Okay. So, the control system problem is the problem of determining the closed loop poles which govern the stability and transient response of a system. Of a system. So we want to know what the closed loop poles are. These poles depend on parameters in the controller, often the gain k. Okay. Refer to the figure below for the following developments. So, say you've got this feedback system, and say you just have a, a gain as your controller, just a feedback controller with a gain K. Then, if we want to know the closed loop transfer function, notice that it depends on K. Okay? So, that is a problem because k we don't know yet we're trying to determine k and so we can't numerically solve for the roots of the characteristic equation for instance if we had a second order closed loop transfer function okay like you can do it analytically third order okay it's not it's not pretty but okay fourth order you can't even look at so finding those, those uh, closed loop holes is actually very difficult to do. I mean, you can, if you had a numerical value for k, you could do it. It's an easy thing to do numerically. But if you don't have a numerical value for k, that's hard to do. Even with all of our segues and everything, it's still hard to do. So with the control, the, con the control uh, I guess I call it the... the control system problem is determining those closed loop holes um, even though you have this gain k in there. So if we break down g and h into numerator and denominator we can rewrite it like this from which we understand that two things. The closed loop zeros are equal to the zeros of g okay so g is the plant and the poles of h okay where h is the feedback loop so 
the closed loop zeros are kind of like a mixture of zeros from G and poles from H. The closed loop poles depend on K, first of all, which, I mean, in some ways you might think, like, oh, bummer, you know, it's hard to solve for them. But also great, because otherwise we couldn't change the dynamics of the system very much if we could only mess with the zeros. So the, the, they depend on K and are difficult to find in general. So that's, that's the big takeaway from there. The root locus will give us a graphical depiction of the closed loop poles for varying values of k. And that's what the root locus is all about. <clears throat> now, well, we're, well I'll, I'll just start, I'll just open that up. First off, before we go into detail in root locus, we need to remember what we learned about complex functions, okay? So there are maps from complex numbers to complex numbers. Recall that Laplace variable S is a complex variable, therefore transfer functions and their Laplace domain function and other Laplace domain functions are complex functions. Okay? So unfortunately, you guys don't really learn very much complex analysis in your courses. It's mostly real analysis that you learn. Complex analysis is something that it's kind of like an advanced mathematical thing. Engineers, however, need to know it, but we don't make you guys take complex analysis courses. We just give you guys just like a little bit here and there in some courses like this uh, and like in system dynamics. So this is stuff that, you know, is a little bit weird at first, but is, you know, not that, not that weird. I mean, taking in a complex number into a function like, not so bad, but when you start thinking about it in terms of, of like, well, where does it take a point in a complex plane to a point in another complex plane? Like, well, how does it map them? And things just get a little bit weird at first. And getting a feel for them, it's a lot less intuitive than a real function where you plug in a real number and you get a real number out. Because that's like you can just do a graph and that looks nice. But for a complex one, it's not so obvious. So... Um, we're going to explore how to evaluate complex functions that are ratios of polynomials. So we do that because our transfer functions happen to be ratios of polynomials, and so that's exactly the type of, tra uh, of, of complex function that we care about evaluating. And in some ways, this is kind of like, this is all in the details, right? Like, it's not, we don't want to get caught up in the weeds. But unfortunately, sometimes this is the part, and these are the parts, these little mathematical things that catch people the worst. It's like, people are like, oh, I can't overcome this, and I don't get the math part. But it's really not um, conceptually that difficult. It's just the fact that the math details can be that. Really, we're just evaluating a complex function at some point. The details suck, however. So, uh, let's take a look here. So I say, uh, let zi be zeros and pj be poles of the transfer function. Then the numerator can be written as the product of s minus the zeros, and the denominator can be written as the product of s minus the poles. So, um, there's actually a a constant out here, but I didn't put that in. I ignored that constant. Uh, recall that we can write a complex number in polar form with a magnitude and a phase. Okay? So, when you're doing complex numbers, that's one thing that you learn. You could write it as like a, a real part and an imaginary part, or a uh, magnitude and a phase. Therefore, we can write each of the factors in this transfer function as a magnitude and a phase. Totally valid. Either you have the real imaginary representation or you have the magnitude and phase representation. So the magnitude of one of these terms would be this and the phase would be this. Okay, this is how we write the magnitude of S minus EI magnitude of s minus pj. Uh, this is the phase of each of those. 
then the magnitude and phase of H, so if you accumulate all of those, are the following. So you can take the magnitude of each individual term and multiply them up in the numerator and divide it by the magnitude of each individual term in the denominator and you get the magnitude of the entire transfer function. That's the first thing. And then the phase is just actually a, a sum. So you, you add up all of the zero phases, so all of the phases from your numerator, and then you subtract all of the phases from your poles, your denominator terms. This should sound vaguely familiar. Um, this is an alternative way to compute the value of a transfer function. The given value of s would be useful when we create a root locus. Okay, so there's that. And guess what now is the root locus, which is probably the part that you guys have been most anxious about remembering because... It, it was pretty central to the controls aspect of what we did. We used the root locus as the center piece of most of our analysis. So pretty much all it is is a plot of where the closed loop poles are for all values of gain k. That's what the root locus is. So it's a pole plot of all of the poles for all possible values of k. And so, I told you, numerically finding those poles is easy. I mean, MATLAB finds it easy, at least. I mean, I don't want to do it, but MATLAB can do it easily. So, what MATLAB does is actually just plug in a bunch of different values for k and compute what the poles are for all those different values. And it just gives you the result. Um, now, root locus plots were developed long before MATLAB was developed. And it used to be the case that you couldn't just do that. You couldn't just have a computer compute all of those possibilities for you. Um, it's great now that we have that tool, but it didn't used to be like that. So they had people learn these rules for drawing the root locus plots that were very ingenious. I mean, that's really cool. I mean, the people were able to do lots of stuff before we had computers. It's almost unfathomable um, how much they could do without, without computers. I mean, I love computers so much. I use them for everything. I, I often think, could I do this by writing a piece of code? And the answer is, Yes, oftentimes. Um, I can do this. Um, doesn't work well for certain things like relationships. Um, Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, that's, I, I mean, really it all comes down to that. And then the, the two, sort of the the mother, the two mother rules for all of the construction rules of drawing these by hand, sketching these by hand, um, are the magnitude and angle criterion. So, the magnitude criterion is that you, you develop it from, so the denominator of the closed loop transfer function is 1 plus kgh, right? So, the poles are the values of s for which 1 plus kgh is 0. Easy enough. So thinking about this in terms of the polar form, we can solve this for um, kgh equals negative 1 by just moving the negative 1 to the other side. And negative 1 in polar form is just magnitude 1 and phase is multiples of, of pi, right? 2 pi, oh, so pi, 3 pi, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just the complex, or that's the polar representation of the, of the real number negative 1. And so the magnitude criterion says, okay, whenever there's a pole, the magnitude of 
kgh is equal to 1. Okay, that's what this says. That the magnitude has to equal 1. And the phase has to be equal to pi or some 2 pi multiple of that. <coughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the whole, those two ideas are the foundation for, if not all of the construction rules, most of the construction rules. Um, so one thing that's nice about it is that it implies that for a point on the locus, we call a region, so when we say that uh, it's a graph of all of the pole locations, we don't actually plot the pole X's everywhere. We just plot a line where all the X's would go through, right? And so wherever that would go through is on the locus, we say. Uh, it's a weird abusive terminology, but that's what we say. So for a point on the locus, the gain has to be equal to 1 over the magnitude of G times the magnitude of H. Um, looking up at the magnitude criterion, we see that, that that has to be true. We're just solving this for K. Uh, this is for assuming K positive. Uh, otherwise, we have to say the magnitude of K is equal to the magnitude, etc. Uh, this is the magnitude of a complex function, the reciprocal of GH to be precise. Uh, we can evaluate that function in the manner we learned previously then and find that the gain to make, so the gain required to place your closed loop holes at some position on the locus that's desirable is just equal to the product of the open loop pole magnitudes divided by the product of the zero, open loop zero magnitudes. So we can find what the closed loop gain should be, k, from evaluating the open loop transfer function at a specific value of s on the locus. <laughs> Pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's weird that you can do that. I mean, it's just fine. it seems like you were able to find out so much information um, without doing much work. Uh, so the open loop pole and zero magnitudes tell us yeah, so we could sketch a root locus. We could say, okay, I want my poles, my closed loop poles to be here on the locus. And then you just plug that value in and you get what the gain needs to be in order to make that happen, which is pretty cool. We don't actually do that by hand typically, but we could. And you can do it graphically too, which is good to get a feel for that graphically. Okay. So I then did an example. Um, and I said, okay, so if you wanted to place the poles at this specific location, it had to be a location on the locus. Okay, so this is one thing about just, if you're just using a proportional controller like this, you can only change the, the controller gain, right? You can't change where the locus is going to go. So I gave you a situation where the locus went straight up and down, and... I said, okay, m choose the gain so that they're equal to, or so that the, the closed loop poles end up right there on the locus. Well, um, and it was easy to do. You can do it graphically, sort of. But that's something that is uh, not typical. It's not typical we can just graphically do this. But back in the day, they would actually graphically do this. They would interpret this totally graphically and evaluate it. It was pretty neat. Um, and it, understanding these techniques now, you know, you might say, ah, it's old hat. Like, we just have MATLAB now. Why even worry about this? When we get into the more advanced design techniques, we're going to start moving the locus around. Right now, with a, with a uh, gain, all we can do is move around on the locus, right? But once we start doing, like, PID control and... Uh, lag lead control and other variants, we can actually move the locus. And <clears throat> understanding how to move the locus around 
is important if you're going to move the locus around, right? Like, you can't just, like, randomly start, like, okay, well, I could find out what the root locus would look like if I just stuck in this term, and you can do it. But you were just randomly stabbing around at that point. So having an idea, having a feel for how to change the locus, that's required uh, once you're doing um, more advanced controller design, which is what we're heading towards. It's not super advanced. There's still At the end of this class, we're going to have an understanding of, a thorough understanding of control theory, like what they call classical control theory, and a little bit of what's called modern control theory both of which are still very, very widely used. So modern is only modern in the sense that the techniques were developed more recently. Classical is classical in the sense that the techniques were developed pre previous to these modern techniques, but they're both used very commonly. And I would say classical is probably used more than modern is used, uh, more frequently than modern is used. Modern is used in really more advanced situations, typically with high-order systems and whatnot, but they're both very good still. Okay. Um, so that was the root locus. And then we went through a bunch of examples of root locus. I recommend you look at. Um, <clears throat> I got into the details of time response. And we I, I kind of wanted to remind ourselves about this here. The transient characteristics... Um, of first and second order systems play a role, a huge role in not just the response of first and second order systems, but also higher order systems. Because it turns out that the first and second order characteristics show up at higher orders as well. They're just like sums of first and second order responses. That's why first and second order is so focused on. It's not like, oh, once you get to third, we don't know anything about it. It's just a third order system is either three first order system responses added together or it's a first and a second added together. So the same characteristics pop up again. So we have something like a natural frequency, something like a damping ratio, something like a, uh, a, uh, uh, a time constants show up again, that type of thing. So for first order systems, um, they have rise times like this. Um, so the time constant of a first order system has a rise time defined as how long it takes to go from 10% to 90% of its final value. That's just a, just a completely uh, uh, just standard way of thinking about it. But it, it, it's not, it's a convention. Just saying, how long does it take to respond approximately? Um, settling time is, uh, for first order systems, is how long, oh, so for any system, is to stay within 2% of its final value. Um, so to get within and then stay within 2% of its final value, it's four time constants for a first order system. Uh, notice also that the time constant is the initial slope, or the inverse of the initial slope, which is pretty cool. Keep that in mind. There's the rise time, there's the settling time. Second order systems uh, have an expression. Um, there's no there's no closed form solution for it, uh, but you can graph it uh, in terms of zeta and omega n. Figure 4.16 in Nice relates to variables, so this is one that graphically is good. You can use a lookup table too. You can just have it numerically solved and find, or or just have a lookup table. All that is fine. Peak time. Time required to reach the first or maximum peak. So it's related to the natural frequency and damping ratio. Percent overshoot is related just to the damping ratio. So if you specify a percent overshoot, and if you specify a damping ratio, they map one to one on each other. Okay. Uh, so here's the expression. Kind of gross, but not too bad. Uh, there's also a figure you can use, or there's a table, I think, too. Settling time uh, is related to zeta and omega n, so uh, it's a nice relationship there. So, and here you go, second order approximations of higher systems. So we do this a lot, we say, okay, we're going to approximate this higher order system to be second order, 
or first order or whatever, um, we're not really going to approximate it in the sense that we're going to make the model that way. What we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to evaluate its transient response in that way. We're going to say that it has approximately a rise time of this, which is related to a damping ratio of this, and we're going to do our design based on that assumption of the second order, even though it's actually not second order. And then, so we, we have some criteria for when it's valid, okay? But the, the best criteria for when it's valid is actually just simulating it at the end and seeing how the response came out. Um, so you can do your, your controller design, assuming a second order system, even if it's higher order, and it could have been a very poor assumption according to these rules. Even though these rules are supposed to get you close. But if in the end your controller works, it was an okay assumption. Okay, So the ends justify the means here. Uh, it's not required that these criteria are met in a sort of strict sense. These criteria are just guidelines for when it's going to be more valid and less valid to assume it's second order. Uh, we try to make sure that the, that the other poles are going to be further out in the left half plane. Why do we do that? We do that because the other poles are further out in the left half plane. They die out really quickly. Their transient responses are over very quickly, and they don't have as much effect. So if they're like five times or further for out, Usually we say, ah, the second order assumption is pretty good. And we do the design based on it. And you might have, you'll end up with, you know, you might say, I'm going to design for a percent overshoot of, of 5% based on a second order assumption. It's a higher order system, and you end up with 7% overshoot. Well, you're close, and then you just tweak your gains a little bit, and you get within the, the requirements. So that's, that's kind of how you go about doing the design. It's not perfect, but you can use it. Um, so I, I said at the end. So it's a good idea, even if you meet these criteria, uh, to simulate anyway. Um, and that's always the way to go with these. Uh, and then we ended with a couple <coughs> controller design examples. So I gave some requirements for percent overshoot, settling time, and rise time, and we went through, drew the root locus by hand, and we went through this process of deciding what the uh, damping ratio should be, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we, in MATLAB, we found what the gain needed to be. And then we simulated it, and it turned out to be just fine, like it worked well. We also did it for an unstable system. We controlled an unstable system. Um, that So this system is unstable open loop. But if you close the loop and you increase the gain above three quarters, apparently, uh, then it actually becomes stable. You can see that from the Routh table. Uh, but you can also go through and compute what gain would be required to make it um, have a percent overshoot of 5%. Five. So that was all the controls that we covered, pretty much that. So we, all we were doing is saying, OK, closed loop, when we just have a gain to vary, um, we can do some stuff with it. Like in this case, it just so happens that our root locus, even though it started off unstable, it goes stable. Right? Pretty great. Uh, let's just increase the gain until it gets stable. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> we can't just increase the gain and then it'll become stable. Usually, the root locus is going to be going in places that are totally undesirable to us. We don't want it to go there. So we can't just change the gain and be good. We have to move the root locus around, okay? And that is going to be what we start with. So we're going to start moving the root locus around to go through specific places in the complex plane that we want our roots to be at, okay? 
Okay, so that is that is, ends our review. I hope that that was a helpful review, and I'm going to let's see. It won't. I hate it. it. Won't give me the option to stop the lecture because. I have too many things up here and the screen's not big enough so I have to unplug